Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, one half of your co-host team here on the show, Hey, if you are brand new and this is your first episode, welcome. Our show is primarily a conversation between Megan and me. We are two moms with eight kids between us, and we live in different parts of the country, and we have super different lives. Well, Megan is off today because every month we publish one interview, and we take turns doing those interview shows. So March is my turn, and here we are. Before I tell you about my guest today, a quick reminder that our 2021 listener survey is up, and it's ready for you. It's a really fast one this time around, my friends. You can do the whole thing on your phone and you don't even have to type with your thumbs. It's like a multiple choice test that you're going to ace. It really helps us continue to evolve the podcast. And the link is right there in the description area of whatever platform you're listening on right now. Or you can type in themomhour.com slash survey and that will get you there too. Okay, my guest today needs almost no introduction because if you are a mom on the internet, you are likely already a huge fan of Kendra Adachi, otherwise known as the Lazy Genius. Kendra hosts the Lazy Genius podcast. She's got an incredible library of Instagram videos and a huge community over there. And she's also the author of The Lazy Genius Way, Embrace What Matters, Ditch What Doesn't, and Get Stuff Done. So a little behind the scenes here, Kendra is part of a podcasting mastermind group that Megan and I are also in. It takes place on Voxer, and it's a group of female podcasters who support one another as we grow our businesses. And while I'd been familiar with Kendra's work for a while, it was in that group that I really got to know her voice a lot better. I can tell you that she's as smart and clear and funny behind the scenes as she is with her audience. Kendra and I talk a lot today about how her lazy genius principles can help moms struggling through a year-long pandemic, moms who are in the thick of raising little kids, and anyone who doesn't connect with traditional, quote, self-help messaging. Kendra also helps me lazy genius a challenge I've been having in my home in real time, which was so fun. Don't forget that as you listen today, everything we talk about is in the show notes at themomhour.com, and that we'll, of course, be continuing the conversation in our Facebook group and over on Instagram. All right, here is my conversation with Kendra from The Lazy Genius. Kendra, welcome to the Mom Hour. Thanks for having me, Sarah. This is so exciting. It's so exciting. I'm I, our listeners are beyond excited. They are <laughs> they are here for this. So I don't want to waste any time. We have a lot to talk about. But let's catch up anybody who isn't already familiar with your work. So just tell us briefly, what is the Lazy Genius Way? And just tell us a little bit about the framework and a little bit about your book, which came out in August of 2020. Yeah, such a great time to release a book, (laughs) right? (laughs) So a Lazy Genius is a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. Because everything cannot matter. That's the whole like, um, how do you do it all? Well, right. no one does it all. Like that's that's how. So what you have to do though is instead of trying to be great at everything, trying to be a genius at everything, or when you see that that doesn't work, you swing to the other side and yes. you're like, screw it, I'm not going to care about anything. Right. But you still care. Like it's kind of sad because you actually do care about certain things, but you don't know how to hold hands with both sides. The the lazy genius way is how you hold hands with both sides is that you can care and be a genius about what matters to you yeah. and you can be lazy and let go of what doesn't. So the lazy genius way, the book um, is a book that highlights 13 lazy genius principles that you can apply individually in combination with each other to literally any situation in your life to help you be a genius about what matters and lazy about what doesn't. Um, I just think that there are too many, like, there are too many systems out there that it's like just plug into mine right. that I already built and it should work for you because it works for me. And then you plug into that person's system and you're like, this isn't working. Right. Something's wrong with me. And then you give up again. This is not you. These are the tools to sort of build your own systems with soul. I love that. I love that so much. 
Um, so the book came out mid pandemic, as we touched mm-hmm. on. Uh, when did you write it? I'm so curious. Like before COVID, like mid COVID, did it bridge? Like we're now exactly one year from kind of when the world changed. So when were you writing the book? Yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> I turned it in in like November of 2019. Okay. So it was written completely. It was written completely before COVID. And it's so funny because when you, when you write a book, the, it's a little behind the scenes stuff is the chronology of the things that are required of a writer in putting the book into the world are so janky. Uh Like you have to write sort of like what this book is about before you Mm -hmm. write the book. It's so strange. So I had sort of made this claim before COVID. I was like, you can lazy genius anything. (laughs) And then... (laughs) And then the pandemic came and I was like, oh, no, can we lazy genius the pandemic? <laughs> I'm having to launch this during one. This is a problem. Turns out, though, you kind of can, um, which was so, so lovely. It was like the uh, like the marketing copy wrote itself. But, you know, it's funny. I didn't I didn't expect I didn't expect us to have to lazy genius something that was so hard. But that's it was exciting in a weird way because it's like these principles really do work for anything because they are principles. They're not rules. They right. change with you, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so I was grateful that, uh, <laughs> that it still worked out even yeah. though I wrote it before well, the world changed. You didn't write a book about like, you know, hosting 200 person parties in your living room or, you know, flying, <laughs> flying across the country <laughs> with your family or something. So yeah, you're right. It probably like kind of put those principles to the test in a more extreme way than you were expecting. Um, but like you said, they held up. So that's that's huge. So let's dig in a little bit more about that. You have this amazing community on Instagram and you do videos and you talk to your audience and they talk back to you. So I'm really curious how the conversations around the lazy genius principles started to change or morph um, last spring, spring 2020. Um, and, and how you think they really do apply when we're in truly crisis or survival mode, because people's worlds obviously were rocked financially and health wise and emotionally and kids are home and moms are struggling. So you have this moment where you're like, oh, my gosh, my my book was not built for this, but maybe <laughs> maybe it works anyway. And then tell me just kind of what you observed about how the principles played out and, and what your audience was experiencing. So the whole the whole basis of thinking and living like a lazy genius is you have to name what matters. Mm. If you don't know what matters, you don't know what to be a genius about and you don't know what to let go. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened for pretty much everybody is this last year has been just like, I'm going to throw you down the gauntlet for you to figure out what matters. Because when everything that we sort of depend on, just like the regular scaffolding of our lives and the places we go and the people we see and just kind of that ordinary stuff, the busyness, the distraction of it all. Like once all of that was taken away from us, it was like, I'm sorry, what are we, what is happening? And it, it was like, for me personally, it was deeply unsettling. Mm -hmm. Um, at first I I remember, so the first like two weeks, maybe I live in North Carolina and we had a stay at home order pretty early on for, for a good while. And so we were like, okay, we're, we're home. And my husband works for, he's a a middle school counselor for our public school system. So he was home because all the kids, no kids were going to school. And, and, um, and so our whole family was home. And at first it was actually really, really lovely. It was, it wasn't quite like vacation. It was sort of like if Wendell Berry took a vacation, (laughs) you know, it was like, it was springtime. I was reading Jaber Crow by Wendell Berry. It was like, the birds are singing, you guys, let's light a fire in the yard. Let's make soup. Like it was, it was idyllic. It was sort of romantic. It was all these things. And then as it got quiet in my house and in my head, I was like, I don't like, I don't like this Mm -hmm. because I was confronted with a lot of the ways that I was depending on that busyness Mm -hmm. and that regular life um, to kind of distract me from what I needed to sort of like work on. Uh, But also more than that, like how much I, (laughs) this is sort of getting really personal. I didn't realize how much I didn't like my parts of myself Mm -hmm. until the pandemic started where I was like, Oh, I don't like being around myself. Mm -hmm. This is not very fun. So that's when I went and found another counselor and, you know, it was good. And, but like all these things that it's 
that's what I started to notice mm-hmm. in the community was that we were all like, oh, this is sort of okay. And then after a couple of weeks, we're like, this is the worst thing ever. Mm-hmm. We can't survive this. And there was no end. There still kind of isn't. Right. It feels really hopeless. And so what started to happen is we all had to cling to what really matters most. It was like a crash course. And okay, well, if I have very limited resources, I have limited people that I can see, if any at all, we're having to be creative about, (laughs) we're having to be geniuses about how to connect with people that we used to just be able to like go to their house or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what it did is it, it's made us care more deeply about the things that we might not have named before. Mm. Um, which I think is so beautiful. And I don't know that we would have really been able to experience yeah. without something like, like the pandemic, yeah. not saying we're glad it happened. No, at all. I know. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean, but that's, that's the thing. Like one of the principles in the book that has been the, <laughs> the one that has shown up the biggest in the last year is live in the season. Okay. That's live exactly. The, okay. That's so yeah. funny. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to ask other than name what matters. Was there one that sort of like sifted? Yeah. I'm making a hand motion here that like as yes. you sift, it kind of like rose to the surface besides name what matters. And so, yeah. So, so go into that a little bit more because I was so curious. Yes, it was definitely living the season, which ironically was the hardest chapter for me to write mm. um, because it's so like <laughs> it's so intangible. The edges of our seasons are so fuzzy, sure. um, like even how to think about it is sort of complicated for me. I'm a pretty linear person. Mm-hmm. I like, I like schedules and all that. And so when you think about like living the season you're in it, there's so much nuance there because you don't want to be like, well, this season is it's over soon. Like ignore what's hard about right. it or, right. you know, like being like toxically positive, all that toxic positivity stuff of like, everything's fine, right. you know, and when it's really not. Or like the other side of that is to lean in so hard I'm thinking of like the season of new motherhood where you're like, well, I guess I just don't shower now. And I guess I don't, you know, and then you lean in so hard because we've been told that like, it's okay. This is the season of life when we're actually probably sabotaging some of the, some of our basic needs um, that could be addressed in very simple, lazy, just genius ways. So I think it can go both, both ways. It 100% can. And I think that's the thing that was so hard about not just writing that chapter, but actually practicing it as a person, because the idea of living in your season is to be honest about how you feel about it, you know, like pay attention to your feelings about it, but not let those feelings run the show, Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I know that your audience has, it's moms and a lot of moms that are in those trenches kind of at home with, and it's, I just got, I, I hated that season. Like it was so hard for me. I, I remember, <laughs> I remember when I had my second, so I have three kids. Um, I have two boys who are 11 and nine. And then my, my daughter is almost five. So when I, um, when I had my, I don't even remember which kid it was, it was either two or three. Cause I had more than one kid at the time. <laughs> and I it was like three weeks in newborn life, you know, where you're just a milk machine yep. and so tired and you just don't even know what's up. And my sister, she was like, let me hold, I think it was Ben. Actually, it was my middle. It was my second kid. She was like, let me hold Ben and you go, you know, kind of do whatever. And I was like, oh, that's great. Thank you. So I put Ben because Ben had jaundice. My Mm -hmm. second had jaundice. And so he had to be on like one of those blue light Mm -hmm. machines for 23 hours a day. And so we just had to hold him like wrapped up in this thing pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. And so my sister was like, well, let me hold him. And I was like, that, thank you. That would be really lovely. <laughs> I left the room. I left the room and I was like doing all these things and, you know, dishwasher and blah, 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 the stuff that you do to try to feel like a person or whatever. I walk back into my bedroom and it is, she is still looking dreamily at his face. Like she has not moved. Uh-huh. You know, she's just like a, like a painting, uh-huh. just looking at the baby. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, how you doing? And she looked up at me. She was like, Oh, I'm great. Are you already done? And I said, Hannah, how long do you think you've been sitting here? And she said, I don't know, like 20 minutes. It had been three hours. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but she had been just lovingly looking at my baby. And what was so funny is the opposite is true of me. Yeah. 20 minutes feels like three hours when I'm holding a baby. 
And so all of that to say, that story is to share. I struggled so much in this those trenches of having little kids. And I think that I pushed away the difficulty because I felt so guilty for not enjoying it. Yeah. I felt so bad. I, I remember walking up to a group of moms that I didn't know very well one time and everybody had at least one kid under two, if not more. And somebody said, and my first baby, my Sam was brand new. And, um, and one of the moms was like, Oh, this is so exciting. Don't you just love being a mom? And I said, no, not really. (laughs) Not knowing that that was like not an acceptable response in this group of people. And they all looked at me like I was the worst person. And, and one person said, I've never heard anybody say that before. And I said, well, I think then people are lying to you. Mm -hmm. They didn't stay friends with me. They didn't invite me to do anything (laughs) after that. It's fine. That wasn't a really safe space. They weren't the people for you. They weren't the people. (laughs) But I guess that's the thing is I see what I, what I was also doing though, was saying to them, if they love that season of having little kids, that they're lying if they say they love it, which isn't necessarily true. We all enjoy different seasons of our lives more than others and more than other people do. So anyway, the idea of living in your season, whether you're in the trenches with little kids or you're living in a pandemic is to be honest Mm -hmm. about how you feel about it, but not let, like you said, not let those feelings be in charge one way or the other that it's like, I'm going to pretend like nothing's wrong or I'm going to be like, screw it. I don't shower anymore. Right. There is a middle of those things. There is. Oh my gosh. That's such a great place to go to break. And when we come back, we're going to really dig into the motherhood stuff and how the lazy genius way can um, help our listeners who are in those trenches time. So be right back. We are welcoming back Gemist as a sponsor today. And Megan, we need to talk about this. I have been using the shampoo, conditioner, and scalp bar that Gemist sent me after I took their online quiz. And I have serious results to report. Okay. Tell me, I need to hear this. So I always want to extend my hair washes to more like every four days instead of every two to three, but my scalp was the problem. My hair still looked okay, but I just felt kind of gross in the scalp area. Well, today is day four, and I do not even have the slightest feeling like it's time to wash my hair. This is a serious difference. Yay. Well, we shouldn't be surprised because there's a lot of science that went into Gemma's formulas, and that quiz you took helped them recommend a specific one just for your hair. Gemis was founded by a mom of two who wanted to make it easy for women to find just the right shampoo and conditioner for their hair. The products are shipped to your door and returns are free within 30 days. Well, if you are ready to have the best hair of your life, try Gemis. Right now, our listeners can give Gemis a try and get 20% off their shampoo and conditioner subscription. Just visit Gemist.com to get your personalized recommendation and enter mom hour at checkout for 20% off and free two day shipping. That's gemist.com, G-E-M-M-I-S-T.com, and enter the code MOMHOUR at checkout to get the best hair of your life. Sarah, this may sound a little strange and very specific, but one (laughs) of my resolutions this year is to learn how to prepare tuna at home. Okay, well, actually, that sounds like a very delicious resolution, and I need more like that in my life, I think. Right? So pre-COVID, one of my favorite things to get when I went to restaurants was ahi tuna. I mean, it's delicious. It's good for you. It makes a great app or a salad or entree. I just love it. So I've really been missing ahi tuna for the last, you know, like year. Then when we started working with our sponsor, Vital Choice, I was like, duh, why don't I just make it myself? But it's the kind of thing I would never attempt if it also meant I had to like track down a fishmonger or try to make a choice at the butcher case at my local supermarket. I just, I have no idea what I'm looking for. So I love that Vital Choice sends the highest quality, sustainable wild seafood right to the house. So all I have to do is say, you know what I wanted to eat tonight? Tuna. And then I go and pull it out of the freezer. And then maybe I add a pepper crust or some Mm. sesame seeds and then sear up them steaks and dunk them in soy sauce. Okay, so I know what I'm doing later. <laughs> I love this. Well, I didn't even know I wanted this, but I may also be having ahi tuna tonight. If you at home are also feeling the ahi tuna love and want to try to make it yourself at home, check out Vital Choice. Vital Choice sends sustainably caught seafood direct to your door, making it easy for you to prepare healthy, delicious meals using their premium wild-caught salmon, whitefish, tuna, and other seafood. They have different subscription box options available depending on what kind of fish your family enjoys, and the purity and quality of their seafood is really unmatched. 
If you've also resolved to cook more seafood at home, give Vital Choice a try by using code MOMHOUR10 when you order at vitalchoice.com. That code will save you 10% on one order. Again, it's Vital Choice, B I T A L Choice.com. And the promo code MOMHOUR10 will save you 10% on one order of delicious, sustainable seafood. Check it out. Okay, Kendra. So we're talking about motherhood. You and I are not that different in our phases. So mine are eight, 10 and 12, but you still have an almost five. So you still like you have a little a a little caboose that's younger than my (laughs) littlest. Um, And you said 11, nine and almost five, right? That's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. Well, our listeners have kids of all ages and we do have listeners with teenagers and tweens but a lot of them are really in it in this phase of not just that new mom, like overwhelm, but then, like you said, like, then you add another kid and, and you're, you already have some commitments. Maybe you had preschool or play groups going on and you're like, you are in it. And then you keep adding more babies as tends to happen. <laughs> um, so here's, I just want to share like how I felt about any kind of like air quote, self-improvement messaging when I was in that phase. I had three relatively close together and I am an Enneagram one and I believe you are as well. I'm sure we have a lot in common there. And we've already touched on the all or nothingness, but that was very much, very much me. So I think I was okay at letting go when I needed to let go. I was, I'm actually for an Enneagram one, I'm pretty good about things like dishes in the sink or getting a little behind on the laundry. But what I what I really resented was any kind of self-improvement message at all. And I was, it was working in the, like I was in the early stages of blogging and writing and working for other bloggers. I was working with Megan at the time, who's Megan is only two and a half years older than I am, but she's more than 10 years ahead of me in motherhood because she started really young. So she Mm -hmm. was, I remember I was working for her on her blog and she was writing about things like, you know, packing lunches and getting, you know, um, staying organized with hand-me-downs for the kids and even gentle stuff like that, I just had a real knee-jerk reaction against because I didn't know how to make minor gentle improvement changes work when I was so in the trenches of little kids. So I wonder if you can relate to that, first of all. Mm -hmm. Um, And then just if the lazy genius way... (laughs) maybe could have helped someone like me or someone listening who <laughs> relates to that kind of all or nothing thinking. And and I'll just say one more thing is I I could have benefited a lot from small improvements. I'm not, I am an Enneagram one, but I'm not a great home manager. Like I really didn't have great systems for cleaning and organizing. Um, I'm more of a, my oneness comes out more in in schedules and work and details and things like that. So, man, I could have used some really gentle coaching, especially around taking care of my home. Um, And I just I rejected it all. I just thought that's not for me right now. So I guess I was accepting my season, but then I was stopping there. Yeah, no, that makes every single word of that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, "Uh uh uh-huh, uh-huh, I got it, I got it. I think what happens, because I've... (laughs) I super do felt the same way about like self-help stuff. Yeah. I'm like, can you, can you stop? Can you stop? I'm doing my best here, right. you know? And I think that what has happened, we'll see if this resonates with anyone. What I think has happened is we get the message, which is a, a real valid one of who you are is enough, mm. right? You're doing great. Who you are is enough. And But what happens is when someone, whether we know in real life or just follow on Instagram or whatever, says, here's this thing, try this thing. Or you're given a self-help book. I love when people give other people lazy genius way. I'm like, are you sure? Do you have a close enough relationship with this person (laughs) that they might not know? They might not know what's inside these pages. They're going to feel really bad. Um, What happens is we connect how we run our lives to how valuable we are as a person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that maybe your resistance, I know my resistance to that whole idea of when people would say like, yeah, maybe you could just like make this adjustment or, you know, my mom would make a suggestion about something. A friend would come over and say, have you tried this? And it went to the core of my being of like, are you telling me I'm failing? I'm failing at this, right? I'm failing at this. Rather than seeing like our humanity 
and being a mom and just like being a person trying to do our best, Mm -hmm. our movements towards improvement, our those small things towards just making the house like flow a little easier or whatever are not. They are not in an effort to make us more valuable people. Mm, They are not in an effort to make us like some ideal version of ourselves. They're just trying to make our life easier. So we're not like as tired at the end of the day or we're not as stressed or it's like there's something about. There's something about. An expectation that if you experience a day where like things are really good, Mm -hmm. you know, like you're in the flow with taking care of your kids, you don't resent you don't resent playing like you somehow are able to play with them for like an hour and it's like wow, that was not as awful as it usually is or whatever, (laughs) you know, and you have this day that feels like such a good day. What you do then is you measure every single day against Mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. And so if every day doesn't match that you're failing and we have got to stop that. We have, we have just got to stop that. And we also have to like sort of give ourselves permission that you can make little, um, you can try to make little changes to maybe like make it so that dinner is a little bit easier to get on the table or, you know, whatever, like you might experience something on this best day and you're like, I'm going to try to replicate that and see if, see if it works again. But if it doesn't, don't beat yourself up. It's like, it's just a different day. Maybe that strategy isn't, it works for, you know, a couple of days in a row, but it's not anymore or whatever. Like there's just no, (laughs) no, there's not, no, that's not fair. There is often very little grace and kindness toward, towards ourselves to separate our movements towards having maybe an easier, more pleasant life that is aligned with how we want to be in the world, Mm -hmm. how we want to be with our kids, how we want to experience our home. There is very little space for us to not let that dictate how we feel about our our value Mm -hmm. as a human being. And that's just got to, that's got to stop. Yeah. That's got to stop. Yeah. Or we're just get like you said, we're going to keep sabotaging our, what really would be great things right. that would make our day easier, like taking a shower. It's exactly. like, you don't have to just be like, well, if I'm taking, cause here's what happens. If I'm, if I am a mom with a kid who's, uh, I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old and oh man, I just found out I am pregnant huh? and you go to Target and you're showered and you have lipstick on, you're going to get attention for having it all together. And then when you go to Target the next day, because yeah. we do it every day, you go, because <laughs> what else are you going to do when you have little children at home? And you go the next day and you're dirty and you're not wearing lipstick. You're like, oh, I'm a failure now. Right. Like, I'm not doing this right anymore. I should be able to do that every day. And that's just not the case. And then the other, the next part, the next thing that we do is we see, like, if we're like dirty hair, don't care day. And then we see a mom in our similar life stage Mm -hmm. who is showered Mm -hmm. and does look cute. We're like, she's trying too hard. Yeah, right. Right. It's just we're cruel to each other and to ourselves in those expectations because we're putting too much value on those choices to determine how important we are as people. And they're separate. They're separate things. You're so right. And I think... A, a layer that gets added to that is when we feel vulnerable and defensive, um, we cling even tighter. Megan and I talk about this a lot. When you feel insecure um, and vulnerable, you cling even tighter to whatever this constructed motherhood identity that you have is, whether it's the pulled together mom with no cracks in the system and the pretty meal plan or the hot mess mom who's dirty at Target. And And rather than seeing that as like a continuum on which we are all like floating each day, sometimes more to one end and sometimes to the other and sometimes in the middle, when we feel overwhelmed and vulnerable, we tend to cling to whichever kind of cartoonishly exaggerated cutout we are clinging to. And then that's when I think that judgment of others and really harshness on ourselves comes out even more. So I love everything that you just said. I would also wanted to add like another thing for me when I was in that stage is I, I thought that the, the small self-improvement ideas, things about meal planning or whatever it was like, you know, putting your hand me down, how to, how to re- 
keep the hand-me-downs for the next baby, little things. I thought they were something I'd get to later. And I just thought, well, I'm not in a stage of life where I, I'm not doing that because I'm just surviving. So I wonder if we can dig into, maybe that was just me, but maybe there are others out there who are like, yeah, 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 Kendra, I love these principles, but I can't apply principles right now because I can't even like barely get any food on the table, like at all. So I don't, I don't need principles. I just need to get through this season and then I'll read the lazy genius instead. Can we flip that around a little bit and talk about, and you can feel free to bring up specific ones of the 13 principles um, that maybe when you are in survival mode and you, you are in this very raw place, how a couple of these principles now, now is the time to use these principles. You don't need to wait till you have your, you know what together. Yes. So, and, and also, by the way, no one ever has all their know, you know what together. Right. Anyway, it's like, we think that that's like what's going to eventually happen. And right. it doesn't like, it just doesn't right. so I feel like the sooner we let that go, it's like, okay, we're all just doing our best every day. No matter if, how old your kids are, it's just the challenges are different. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, this is, I wish that I had had this book when I had my two boys two years apart. Um, And so much of what I share in the book came from those years, Mm -hmm. came from the struggle of those years, because I felt like I was losing myself in motherhood. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was, I didn't really love that season. I felt guilty for that. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I could share that with anyone. I also really do like things to be you know, to kind of know what's coming. I like for things to be a little bit easier and was beating myself up when they weren't, you know? And, um, and I think that the, the balance, which that word is kind of a tricky word right now anyway, but like, it's the middle, it's that middle place. It's like, it's not all genius or all lazy. Mm -hmm. Like what you were just saying, it's like, you don't, these caricatures, like we're all existing on on a spectrum Mm -hmm. and it is, it changes every day. So I think that when you're sort of like deep in survival mode and you're like, I can't, I can't do anything. I'm just trying to survive the, the, there are four principles that come to mind actually for being in survival mode. One we've already talked about, which is living the season. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the season where I don't, I don't make big decisions. I don't make big changes unless it's like, Oh, I feel good. I, I feel like I have the energy today to do that. Right. But really, it's like, no, this is a season for taking three hours to fold a load of laundry because your two-year-old wants to help. Right. That's what this season is. And it doesn't make it easy. But when you think about what matters, does, does what matter, is it to get the laundry folded or is it to have your kid feel loved mm-hmm. and sit next to you? I think you know the answer. Right. But that's not to guilt you and to be like, um, well, I have to love every minute of these three hours. No, you actually don't. Right. But it helps to put it into perspective when you remember, remember what matters more, you know? So, so living in your season is so, so important. And again, the basis of all of this is to, is to name what matters. Um, a second one that comes to mind is to let people in. Mm. Um, I think that we get so isolated in motherhood, especially with, with tiny ones. And and even if you're like in play groups and, you know, right now, obviously a lot of that looks different for, for people, but even if you have sort of these groups and stuff, you often are only letting them in to a point. Yes. Agreed. You're only letting them in to where it feels like the solidarity feels comfortable. But what if you feel differently about something than they do? Mm-hmm. And you're just like, oh yeah, this that thing was great. And in your head, you're like, it was not like, I did not, that strategy didn't work for me. Or, you know, like I remember being in a group of moms and they all, uh, we were, you, we were diapering differently. Mm-hmm. Um, like I had done cloth diapers for my first two, because I was like, I don't know, it mattered at that point mm-hmm. for my third, it did not, mm-hmm. um, at all. And so I remember like talking to some moms who were cloth diapering and, and, And it was very easy for me to feel judged for making a different decision. And so when we're in those groups of, of moms, it's, we're like secretly deciding like within us, like, okay, do I let, do I, do I let this part out? We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Like it's, you're not really, you're not always fully open and letting people in. And so I think that 
when you're in the trenches asking for help, um, being honest about how you're feeling, obviously not everybody is a safe place for you to be like completely honest, but that's just part of being a human right. is sort of learning, you know, like I learned with that group of moms in the street <laughs> where I was like, Oh, you guys are not a safe space for this yeah. kind of conversation. That is okay. We're not going I'm, there yet. We're Got not going to do Forever. that. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to do that again. Um, and so it's not that I did something wrong. It's like, Oh, I learned, I learned mm -hmm. from that, that that's not the place for this. Um, but to let people in to not, I always say like, you don't have to be in a crisis to ask for help. Mm, I love that. So like much. you, you need to ask for help all the time. And yes. like, if a friend says, I'm going to target, do you need something? I'm going to Costco. Do you need something? Can I bring you a coffee? Let's say you're having a good day or you're not like crying. You're like, you feel bad saying, sure. That'd be great. No, no. Say sure. That'd be great. Oh, yes. Can you so pick me true. up milk? Like just say yes. Let people in, let people help you when they offer. Don't I, re I remember this is one of like the most beautiful um, stories of being a mom is so my, my daughter was brand new. She was fresh out. So that means the boys were like uh, four, four and six, you know, so still very, very energetic and mm -hmm. not, not great at decision-making. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted a Whopper like from Burger King. <laughs> I wanted a Whopper so badly. I was like about to cry. But for some reason, I didn't have access to a car or maybe Annie was sleeping. It was some yeah. sort of thing where I couldn't get a Whopper. And I was like, can I, can I call somebody to have them bring me a Whopper? <laughs> and I texted my friend Amy, who lives in the neighborhood, who had older kids than me. So I knew that right. she, you know, we don't even really talk that much. She, she's just like one of those friends that when I see her, I really love being with her. But right. it's not like we're in each of those lives every day. And I texted her and I was like, hey, so like, are you busy? would you want to bring me a Whopper? <laughs> and she was like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And she brought me a Whopper and a Dr. Pepper. And we talked in my driveway for like five minutes. I don't think I saw her for like a year after that. Like that is and amazing. it was the most connective thing. Like I still remember that is one of the dearest moments. Like it makes me want to cry. Like that she showed up for me and she didn't make me feel bad about it. She was like a Whopper. She like, probably loved it actually. Right, like often, right. especially if we're a little bit ahead of someone we know, we know, we know. She probably knew exactly that <laughs> stage you were in, but we don't always yeah. know how to ask. And we don't want to, we don't want to like have our offer to help be one more thing on the new mom. So she or probably to make her feel like she's doing something wrong. Exactly. Like, how can I help or whatever? It's just, it's so complicated, right? Oh, I would love to be asked. I mean, I would, I would be the same. I would hop in my car. Um, that would, yeah, I love that. I love that. Right. story. So letting people in, like just this is the this is the season to practice that yeah. in small ways, because what happens is if you wait for a crisis to ask for help, you often don't know who to ask mm -hmm. because you haven't connected with anyone over those th over those little things. So um, let people in, let people in, let people in mm -hmm. um, another one, which is feels impossible um, when you're in the trenches, but is this is, might be the stage where it's the most important. And that is to schedule rest, mm. not just rest, but like schedule it. Like you need to schedule it. Um, and in the book, I, I kind of lay out like sort of different ways to look at that where it's um, daily rest, um, maybe weekly, maybe seasonal rest, mm -hmm. but then also just like on the inside, mm -hmm. like how you're feeling on the inside. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's the one that's, sort of the most important to grab onto is like when you feel like my friend Emily uses the phrase, um, sitting down on the inside, mm. like I want to be sitting down on the inside, not like running around. And yeah. I feel like I'm always running on the inside, mm. especially when you're in that season of life. Mm. Um, I think that's actually one of the, one of the difficulties that isn't really articulated very often is that that stage of life when you have little kids at home is so slow mm -hmm. in so many ways. You're just like, we're just here again. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> we're doing the same thing again. And it doesn't feel like you're, you've got anything to show for it. Mm -hmm. But on the inside, you are like manic. I mean, it's just constant. And, and so to think about how you can rest on the inside. Um, and I think there are different ways that that people can go about that because we're all different people mm -hmm. naming what matters and remembering what matters in that moment really helps mm -hmm. to kind of calm all the things that you're like, well, I should be doing this or I yeah. can't believe I'm doing this or I hate this or whatever. Like remembering what matters helps slow the speed a little bit. 
Um, but I think another thing that we forget to do, and it's really important to do when you've got little kids, is to know and then do what makes you feel like yourself. Mm, yes. We don't know. We, that's why we lose ourselves. Yeah. Because we don't do that on a regular basis. And so um, just to think like, what makes you feel like yourself? That really is the definition for me of self-care is to do what makes you feel like yourself. Um, and to come back to yourself like, oh, there she is. There she is. She's back. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And if you are a schedule person like you are and like I am, one of the things that I'm learning now at 41 is that I can use my gifts as a good time planner and, and project planner and scheduler to um, apply those to things that are a little softer and gentler, like scheduling rest or like mm. looking at the week ahead and building in a play or creativity. And it took me, I mean, forever because I've only applied those things to things like work and nap schedules and meal yeah. plans. Um, but if you are someone who comes naturally to schedules and structures, I just love the idea of flipping that around and being like, great, I'm going to structure myself into a place of calm or into a place of play or creativity or rest. So I don't know why it took me so long to start thinking of it that way, but not all scheduling has to have productivity or achievement as its output, if that makes sense. I, my hands are in the air. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And more people need to be saying it because we just like this is why um so many moms that I talk to and hear from feel guilty when they're like I I want to like I want to go to a bookstore by myself. I want to go browse the used bookstore for a couple of hours by myself and they're like if they're, you know, if you're married, if you have a partner, you're like, is it okay? Like, can I go? Right. And then you apologize when you leave, you apologize when you come home. Yeah. If it was hard, you're, you know, it's like, this is the whole, like, um, when you call your partner uh, a babysitter, like uh, if you, yeah. if you're a stay at home mom, um, and you have a husband, you tend to like, well, he's going to babysit. It's right. like, no, nope. he's going to be their dad. Yeah. That's not a thing. Yep. Yep. Dads are not babysitters. Yep. So, and you don't have to feel badly taking that time for yourself. Right. You know, we just, I don't, we do, we just feel so bad. It's like, should we not need it? You know, do we feel badly because we feel like we shouldn't need it? Right. We feel badly because um, there's something like wrong with us. If we want space from our kids, if we enjoy time right. to ourselves, that's garbage. You know, yep. it's like we have all of these lies. Right. Basically. Somebody else, like the next door neighbor has it even harder because she works two jobs and has twice as many kids. And she doesn't seem to need it. So why should I? That's exactly. a, that's another big one. Yes. Um, and I also want to say on the flip side, because Megan and I do this a lot because we're so opposite and Megan is not schedule oriented. She's very intuitive and goes very much with her own energy pattern. So if you are listening and you are a mom who isn't schedule oriented, um, I think there are just as many ways to honor rest and to honor your own energy patterns without it having to look like the same kind of schedule that Kendra or I would put together. And those 100%. lazy genius principles of scheduling rest, I would imagine can work no matter how you approach time and time planning, right? Maybe a different word for that would be choose rest. Yeah. Just choose that. it, choose it. Um, and I, you know, I think it's even simple things like if let's, okay, for me, music makes me feel like myself mm -hmm. listening to music that I love. It just makes me a different person. Um, so does walking outside, just like trees and air. And mm -hmm. it's so happy. And if I do those two things together, I literally am a different person. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I'll text my husband, even, you know, now, obviously I'll text my husband and I'm like, um, so when you leave for work, we are, we're tapping out, we're going to high five and I'm gonna go out. I need to walk. I need 20 minutes. And he's like, got it. And I feel like a different human when I return. It's like, I feel like myself, it's not different. I feel like myself yeah. again. And so just thinking about when you're home with your kids, like, let's say, music calms you down. It helps you sit down on the inside. No matter, it could be Demi Lovato. Like it doesn't have to yeah. be quiet music for that to be the case. But let's say that there's music that makes you feel like yourself and more calm. You could um, create, uh, there's a principle called house rules. You could create a house rule and it doesn't have to be like a harsh word. Rule is not a harsh word. Um, it's just more like, hey, this is a choice we've made right. as a family. You can make a house rule where it's like, um, 
okay, Timmy, Timmy, you get to pick the music in the morning and mommy gets to pick it in the afternoon or whatever. And it's like, that's what we do. That's our rhythm together. We both get to choose. And so you have that kind of built in where you're like, oh yeah, it's, you get to have your turn again tomorrow. Aren't you excited? Now it's mommy's turn. And you know, like it doesn't have to be like this really big grand thing. It's just like, how can you experience yourself Mm -hmm. each day? I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, you are going to lazy genius, a challenge that I have in my house. It's going to be so fun. I'm so excited. All right. We'll be right back. Sarah, I want to formally lodge a complaint. Okay. It is not fair how soft, functional, and cute baby and toddler sleepwear has gotten in the years since my kids were little. Did you know there is such a thing now as a two-way zipper on baby pajamas so that you can like Zip up from the bottom if that's what you need to do. Oh, I know. This is very unfair, but it's great news for our listeners. And our sponsor, Nest Designs, has the cutest, softest sleepwear and apparel made with sustainable, eco-friendly materials. Plus, they make crib sheets, burp cloths, and even pajamas for moms, which we got to try. I love the pajama set that Nest sent me. It's made from a bamboo blend, and I can tell it's going to be that perfect weight for spring and summer sleeping. Nest is based out of Vancouver, Canada, and they've made giving back to important causes and taking care of the environment top priorities. So you can feel great about your purchase while indulging in some adorable prints and designs for your kids. And if you're in the market for a new diaper bag, I think that Isla tote is so cute. Megan, do you think maybe we could just buy diaper bags as purses now and not tell anyone? I bet we could get away with it. (laughs) Yeah, they are so cute, those diaper bags. Okay, so check out the brand new spring and summer collection at nestdesigns.com and then use the promo code MOMHOUR to receive 10% off your purchase. That discount is good on everything except gift cards. Again, it's nest, N-E-S-T, designs.com and the promo code is MOMHOUR. So Sarah, guess who's a lot less stinky these days? Oh my gosh, are we talking about your armpits again? Okay, not this time. Actually, this time we're talking about my hound mutt, Moxie. So Sarah, you know, she's always been pretty smelly, but I swear in the winter, she just gets worse. And also she's getting old and her mobility isn't that great. So giving her a bath in the winter or taking her to the groomer in the snow, it's just an ordeal for everyone. But we've been using the deodorizer from Scouts Honor and it's really working. She has a much more pleasant aroma these days and it's a scent I really like too. Well, good for Moxie and especially good for you. We've loved Scouts Honor's grooming products in our house, too. They help with itch relief, odor control, and an overall healthier skin and coat. Scouts Honor sent us each some shampoo, a detangler, and a deodorizer to try. And I actually love the Dog in the Woods scent, which is really just sandalwood and vanilla. I love the detangler for Xander's curly, curly curls, too. I am also a big fan of the Dog in the Woods scent. And with the deodorizer we've been using, you just spray it on the coat and then kind of rub it through your dog's, like, stinky spots. And then you're done. No need for a full bath. So it's kind of like a dry shampoo for dogs. So Scouts Honor's grooming products contain probiotics and they're scientifically proven when applied to the skin, those probiotics support healthy bacteria and fight against the bad bacteria that cause irritation. And with every purchase, Scouts Honor provides one day's worth of meals for rescue animal in need. Check out all of Scouts Honor's award-winning products today available online or wherever pet supplies are sold. And to receive 20% off your first order, go to scoutshonor.com slash mom hour. That's scouts with a K. So S-K-O-U-T-S-H-O-N-O-R.com slash mom hour for 20% off your order. Okay, Kendra, we are going to live Lazy Genius, a challenge that I'm bringing to you that you don't really know much or anything about. Are you ready? I don't know anything about it. I okay. don't. I'm very excited. Okay. So I really did just try to think of something that's kind of just, uh, you know, that buzzing, annoying, like it's not working well in my home. So this, I would say this is mostly home related with a little bit of parenting or house rules thrown in and you can help me. We moved into this house in July. We moved mid COVID. Um, We gained a lot of amazing space. I truly love my home and I'm loving the way it functions. Um, We have what we call a bonus room. The it's a, it's a ranch style home, one story and a long time ago, like 25 years ago, somebody took the original garage, converted it into it's sunken by like three steps. So you walk down like three steps, but it's on the same level. Otherwise, um, it has a cool brick floor and it used to be a two car garage. And now it's a completely functional room. I, I describe it to people who have basements. California people don't have basements. 
but it it functions like a basement would in that we've got a big screen in there. We've got comfy couches. There's a little art table. It even has like a little wet bar area, like a mini fridge and a sink. Um, so it's all purpose family enjoyment. We can send the kids in there to watch a movie. They can do an art project in there. And I love having a home that has a dedicated space like that. Here's the problem. You walk through it to get to the garage, the new, the garage that was added when this used to be a garage. Mm-hmm. So it's not like a basement or um, in one of my old houses, I had like a loft playroom that was kind of nice. You didn't have to walk through it. This I walk through probably six or eight times a day to get to my car in and out of the garage. The challenge is I want to have a home where kids feel like they can build a fort and leave it up for a couple of days. That's a value to me. I want I, I'm like I really love open ended creative play. We're a year into a pandemic. My 10 year old is obsessed with paper airplanes and does them like six hours a day. And I want him to be able <laughs> like to make 14 paper airplanes and fly them all around and have them. So in theory, I want a room that that can look like it's mid project for a reasonable amount of time. The problem is I don't want to walk through it eight times a day. (laughs) And I'm having trouble, even with my almost 13 years of experience of motherhood. And I'm pretty good at like, I'm very good at boundaries. I am not a mom who has trouble making rules and sticking to them. But this one feels like a conflict because both sides of me want, I want like, I want art projects out on the table. I want kids who build forts and go in there and disappear. And like, I walk in and it looks like it's been transformed into a different room. I want that in my soul, but I don't (laughs) want to walk through it. And it, it, every time I walk through it, it honestly is like, it just, I shrink, you know, when your muscles just kind of like tighten and I'm stepping over stuff. So that's my challenge. I, so I don't have that situation in my house, obviously like where I'm having to, that I, I resonate with that energy so much where you're like, (laughs) I really want you guys to have this space in my soul, but I don't want to have to look at it. Right. <laughs> I feel that so much. Oh, okay. So, all right. I've got some questions. Okay. When you, when you, um, when you get home mm-hmm. and you open the door, how do you feel before you open the door? Are you thinking about what you're going to find in the bonus room? Um, like when are the, when are the thoughts of like, <laughs> yeah, about how it looks. Like, when is that at its ooh, that's highest? A, ooh, that's a great question. You know when it is. It's because I my kids do get to go to school in person. I'm very fortunate and grateful for that. And it's often I've been home working for the school day um, while they're gone. And then I go to leave the house to go get them. And I think, ah, like they're going to come home into this and it's just going to get worse. It's, it's like my, I want to have had some kind of a reset even a middle, a middle ground reset. And it hasn't been done. And maybe the reason I think that when I'm walking out the door, maybe is because somewhere in there, I think I should have done this while they, instead of working or while they were at school or somehow like I, I'm not keeping this up, even though it's totally their mess and Mm -hmm. they're old enough, but that's interesting. That's often when I think about it, it's less when I come, when I come home, I've probably just recently already seen it. It's when mm-hmm. I haven't seen it in a few hours and I'm like, Oh God. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. It sounds like you just had some wheels spinning, even as you were saying those words mm-hmm. of like, Oh, I hadn't really realized that. Mm-hmm. So you feel like you have to, it's on you to, you should have done it. You should have like, or I should have made them do bit. it either way. Mm-hmm. It can kind of go both ways. Mm-hmm. Do they, th- this is such a f- funny uh, question because I'm imagining my own kids. Like, Sometimes I'm like, do my kids, do they care? No. Like, are yeah. they, are they impacted by visual clutter? Like I am like, if, if a room is messy, like right now I'm, I'm in my bedroom and, uh, we got some packages delivered and all of the packaging is on my bed. And I'm like, can I, I need to throw it away. Like it's cause I'm looking at it right yeah. now. And I, so I, there's like a, like you said, there's like a buzzing mm-hmm. <laughs> like within you of like, can we, can we fix this where you start to like panic a little bit? Do your kids feel that way at all? Or are they sort of happy they're, enough with the space? They're pretty happy. It takes until they don't have room, right, to do mm-hmm. the next thing. And that's usually what we do. What Usually what we do is when they want to do the next thing, get out a different craft or build a different fort, then, then we say, well, obviously we need to kind of get this room back to one. So I think I think what I'm looking for, honestly, sometimes it's just the footpath. If I could walk mm-hmm. through and not be kicking 
paper airplanes or dirty socks. So it's like, I think yeah. that's what it is. It's like, there is a middle ground in there somewhere where they can leave projects out and I can, I could be fine without it. It doesn't need to be perfect. Yeah. I haven't found that middle ground and I haven't found the way to include them in those expectations. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a couple of, a couple of thoughts. Okay. That we could, a couple of principles we could pull out. Yeah. One is, um, there's a principle. I wish I knew the numbers. I don't remember the numbers. We'll pretend it's number seven. Okay. Um, there's 13 of them. It doesn't matter. Um, but one is put everything in its place. Mm. Now your, there are certain spaces and in our homes where like this bonus room, where everything in its place is like wherever it lands right. in many ways, because <laughs> that is sort of the general purpose of the room Right, is that it's okay that things are out. You know, like you said, like that's actually something that you value right. that that matters to you. Um, so, But what we kind of do, it's sort of like that all or nothing again, where it's like, well, everything's just going to be trash all the time right. or everything has to be in labeled bins. Right. So it's more like thinking about sort of a middle ground of that. If there is like if you notice that there is a consistent type of thing right. that's in your way and just go like, is there a better place for that? Yeah. Maybe that thing is out because there's no place for that. Like the mm. paper airplanes, yes. like um, maybe if we had like a hanger, <laughs> you know, like if we make, here's this basket. Yes. Kid, I love like when you, I don't want you to throw away your airplanes. Here's this giant basket, put them in here. Right. Like when you're done, if, and, and see if that clears your footpath, like yeah. give it a place. So, it's because sometimes things are out because they just don't have a place. That's um, so, true. so that's one, that's one thought. Another thought, um, and this combines house rules and then uh, build the right routine. Mm-hmm. Let me say a word about routines real quick. So a lazy genius routine is not like I'm going to do these five things in order every single time. A routine is really an on-ramp to a goal. Mm-hmm. And so if you name what you're after, if you name where you want to go, the steps that you take to get there are secondary. Mm-hmm. So like if you want to feel like yourself in the morning, you don't need to have a morning routine where you like do all these 10 things because what if you oversleep and then you're like, well, my routine is screwed. It's like, no, no, no. The goal here is you just want to feel feel like yourself before everyone wakes up. So just like make your coffee and listen to a favorite song while you make your coffee. One song, it's four minutes. Right. And then that's like enough kind of thing. Like pay attention to where you're actually going. So if you think about what you're after, not for the purpose of the room, because you've already named that. Yeah. But like for you. Yes. <laughs> what are you after when you finish working in the morning and you're going to get the kids and you're seeing the space and you're like, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Maybe if you name like what you want to experience in that walk, you can sort of think through like a couple of things yeah. that you can do to get you there. like. A house rule could be before everybody leaves for school. Would you guys help and make sure that we can have a clear walk to the door? Or can everybody grab four things and put them on a surface? Yeah. Can everybody, you know, like something really like it doesn't have to be like really rigid or whatever. It's just like grab your four things, please. Because it's those little bits. Like you said, it's like a mid reset. It's not a huge one. It's just a little like a middle ground something. Yeah. And that could be part of your going to school routine. That could be part of your going to get them routine, yep. you know, where you're like, I'm going to pick up too. five things or whatever. I get real uh, black and white about wanting my kids to be quote unquote responsible for their own stuff. Yeah. To almost to, I think some moms have the other problem and do, and you know, clean up after their kids constantly. I, again, I think there's probably a middle ground. Like if my mental health is better because I just decide that in this season of life, I pick up my 10 year old socks from the floor yep. and he's learning responsibility in 14 other ways. Yeah. I actually, it would be, it would take one second and I would be happier. But because exactly. I think I, I have to raise a kid who picks up their own socks, then I leave the socks there, feel grumpy, forget to ask him later. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, yes, I 100% yeah, know what you're saying. <laughs> so it's like, it starts with faulty logic. Like, yeah, he's only going to learn responsibility if, if the, in this season of life, he always picks up his own socks. And I therefore, can't or should not do it for him. So yeah, I'm having all kinds of, all kinds of like epiphanies as we're talking. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I think that's why principled living is so helpful because it's not like, I don't need to give you a system. 
Like you don't need one, right? You know, like you really don't need one. It's just more like, what's this? An, a, another, um, another lazy genius principle is to start small. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't need to build this grand machine. They break anyway. Right. Like we work so hard to create this. Like we're going to track these things, and we have, you know, like these. A lot. That's why we all buy seven planners every right. year mm-hmm. because we're looking for the one that holds all the things that we think we need to hold. Yep. And we're building this big machine and we spend more energy maintaining the machine than we do experiencing what we hope the machine gives us. Right. So if we just start small, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. That feels good. Like yep. I'm gonna pick up the socks. Yep. We're gonna, we're gonna scooch, we're gonna scooch those paper airplanes to this corner of the room. Yep. And then they still are experiencing the room that holds the value that you've already put to it, mm-hmm. where it is a room that can be mid project. Mm-hmm. And then you are also like remembering what matters of like, I care about this, right. but I also don't want to be overwhelmed by this clutter right. or my expectation of my kid's involvement in right. the clutter. And just tell yourself the truth, pick up the socks and go get them from school. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. I'm, my wheels are already turning too, that I realize I've conflated all kinds of clutter equally conflated is the wrong word. Like I've assigned an equal value to all types of clutter in that room. Yes. And I bet if I kept digging, if we had another hour right. to analyze, <laughs> I'd realize that there's probably one or two dirty socks has already like, you know, yep. reared its ugly head. But there's probably one or two types of clutter that are particularly triggering for me where mm-hmm. if I if I zeroed in on that and it's almost like naming naming what matters in the opposite direction, naming what is really irritating me versus ass- assuming that I have to have it completely clean to feel good. So, yeah. There is a there's a, a principle called uh, essentialize. Yeah. And the way that you there are three steps to essentialize is you name what matters. Number one. Mm-hmm. Number two is you calm the crazy. Mm-hmm. And then number three is you do whatever feels right next. So you're ap- and you're absolutely right that if we just sort of calm what's crazy in our heads, in the space, in the conversation, like whatever it is, like it's amazing the space it opens up. Mm-hmm. Like it's. It's almost like an exponential sort of thing. Whereas if you go into that room and you're like, what in here makes me crazy? It's not the fact that the room is messy. That's actually not really what it is. But what about it? Exactly. And if you name what that thing is and then you create a routine or a house rule or a start small or Mm -hmm. a reminder of living in your season for that particular thing and calm that crazy, it really does change everything. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you. Um, so I happen to know, Kendra, that you are furiously working on edits to your second book. So real quick before we wrap, can you tell us what can you tell us about book number two? I really need to talk to my publisher about what I am allowed to say <laughs> about book two. I haven't like clarified that, um, but I've, I've said it enough out loud that maybe it's maybe it's fine. Then we'll get too mad. Um, but no, it's called The Lazy Genius Kitchen. Oh, awesome. I know, which I'm so excited about. Um, it's not a cookbook. Uh, which a lot of people, you know, you expect that sure. from like a, a kitchen book. But the problem is, guys, we keep buying cookbooks, expecting our like frustrated lives mm-hmm. in the kitchen to change. And you don't need another cookbook. You need <laughs> you need a way to have what you need, use what you have and then enjoy your kitchen. And then, you know, what cookbooks to buy, you yeah. know, what recipes actually matter to you. So it's it's sort of like this. Um, it's like giving you tools and teaching you things about the tools that you have, like yeah. I'm literally talking spoons all the way to like, how do you plan your meals? How do you clean up your kitchen? How do you gather people around your table? Like, how do you do this through the lens of what matters to you in such a way that you you and your kitchen are friends and you're not like so angry at it every time you walk in? <laughs> I love <laughs> that it. space. So um, it's going to be illustrated. I know I'm allowed to say that it's going to be like really, really beautiful. Like it's I hope it is a treasured resource uh in people's cookbook collections like it's like a pal yes all these cookbooks that you have um but it comes out in march of 2022 oh so, so a year from now yeah a year from now it's fine um apparently like highly designed books take a long time to yeah. create so we have to write them really, really you're quickly. like then why am i working so hard on these edits if it's not for a year <laughs> i know it's not for a year <laughs> um but i'm just like i my first job that i created for myself was, uh, as a cooking instructor, like I taught cooking classes in my kitchen and gathering is like my favorite thing ever. So this has sort of been in my marrow since I was 
20. Oh, and um, won't, we, won't we be so excited to be having those larger gatherings and no. cooking for big fam, you know, big groups. And just um, I can just see people returning to a kitchen energy that goes beyond feeding hungry little like short people who just <laughs> want peanut butter and jelly every day. All the time. Yeah. Every single time. Do you like have you ever thought about how many goldfish you've bought yeah. in your life? Like how many of those little goldfish crackers have graced your house? It's yeah. like. Oh, this is so many of them. I know. I know. So, oh, yeah, I'm excited gosh. about the book. I love it. Okay. And where I, I mean, I assume everybody's following the Lazy Genius on Instagram, but if not, that's a great place to get to know you through your IGTV and your videos and just your, you know, your stories and your posts. It's so helpful, so digestible. If moms listening are in a season of life, even where a book doesn't feels like maybe that's not part of your season. Um, you don't want to miss Kendra on the Insta. Anywhere else you'd love to send people to follow you. And of course, buy the book wherever, buy the first book, wherever books are sold. Yeah. You know, I think probably the, I have a podcast, the Lazy Genius Podcast. Duh. And I, well, yeah. no, 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 I think, I think that what makes, cause you're absolutely right. Like when you're, when you're a mom and you have little kids, like sitting down to read a book is a joke. Like it's right. just, it's not really a thing. I do read the audio book. So if you wanted to oh, listen to fun. the book, you, you could get that, but the podcast, the episodes are like somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes most times, and they're titled very specifically. So um, you could have like <laughs> anything that you have that buzz pain point around, yeah. like you just scroll those titles and you're like, oh, I'm gonna listen to that one. Yeah. Um, I think that could be a really great companion for, for anybody. I listened to the Lazy Genius adult screen, does adult screen time just the other day, and it was fantastic. So, Thank you. Yes, I agreed. loved that episode. That was a favorite. I have people on Instagram vote for their favorite episode of the month, just so I can yeah. kind of know what is resonating. And that was like far and away a favorite that month. Um, awesome. So I'm so thanks for listening. That, yeah. that means a lot. I can't believe I, I didn't that. bring up the podcast. It was like, it's so foundational that I was like, <laughs> you all know. Well, now everybody knows you have a podcast. Um, okay, Kendra. Well, thank you again for helping me and helping all the moms listening today. And then as always, everyone listening, our show notes will have links to everything Kendra and I talked about. Um, and yeah, I just can't wait to share this with our people. Uh, thanks for having me. This was so great. 